wow, we're already at number 26. Time certainly flies and with two releases each year, it's so easy to lose track. R26 marks the first cinema release for 2022 and has some interesting new additions. There's a ton of small improvements here and there, but it's three features in particular most people will be interested in. Modeling improvements, the new simulation additions, and finally some big changes to rendering. Let's have a closer look. This is easily the most fun feature of the release. You can spend hours upon hours mucking about with different settings and values. The possibilities are truly endless. We can get so many different looks just by adjusting values. I'm sure it's the first thing a lot of people will dive in, and I'm sure we'll get to see some insane designs in the coming months. The good thing is that we don't really have to learn much to start using the new simulation additions because the workflow is similar to the old tools. So let's see how we can reproduce this simple example. Let's bring in a plane object, subdivide it a couple of times, and make it editable. This is going to act as our cloth surface. Now we need to add the cloth tag, and as you can see already, we have quite a few new options. But before we play with those, let's first fix the endpoints of our cloth so it stays in place. And now if we hit play, we already have a nice looking cloth moving around. Perfect. Now let's see what more we can do. We can easily change the properties of the cloth and how it moves and folds by adjusting these values. We can go from a heavy piece of fabric that doesn't fold that easily to a rubber type of surface. For example, by increasing the bendiness and stretchiness, we can get a more draped look. Of course, we can have the cloth interact with other objects. Let's add a sphere, but before I do that, let's tone down a few of the cloth settings so the look is not as extreme. Perfect. Now for the sphere we need to add two tags. The first one is going to be a body tag. If we just add that to our sphere, it won't interact with a cloth at all, so we also need to add a collider tag. Now if we hit play, the cloth will catch the ball. In order for us to tear the cloth, we need to go through this awesome little section. Adjusting the values will give us very different results. The tear past option is the control that tells Cinema to tear the cloth after it stretches a specific amount. And the tear guiding angle controls the tearing based on the previous tear that already happened. Of course, how the tearing looks depends also on the properties of our cloth. So here for example, we tell Cinema to tear the cloth after it stretches more than 500%. But if we increase the stretchiness to something higher, our cloth won't tear at all. Changing the tear angle will also give us different kinds of tearing. And the same goes if we change the friction. As I've mentioned already, it's so easy to lose track of time. It's so much fun playing around with the values and seeing the different results we can get. But that's not all. We have several more cool things when it comes to simulation. By enabling the balloon option, for example, we can have a closed object take the properties of, <laughs> you guessed it, a balloon. And of course, we can combine this with other simulation related objects. We can add, for example, a collider, and then with the wind object, move the balloon and have it pop when it hits the collider. Where things get even more interesting is when we add the connector tag to the mix. The job of this tag is really simple, it connects two or more pieces together. Let's take as an example these three pieces of cloth. The first and last piece has the endpoints fixed, 
but other than that, they're not really connected in any way. So if we hit play, they all do their own thing. But now if we add a connector to the middle piece and hit create, the three pieces will be connected and act as one. Let me zoom in super close so you can see what's happening. Once I hit create, these yellow lines are created which indicate that the pieces are now connected. And now if we hit play, they all act as one big piece. And since all these options are animatable, we can split these pieces just by animating the tear past value. Let's see it once more without the connectors. Perfect. The new simulation engine also brings new abilities when it comes to splines. With the rope tag, we can create all sorts of effects like ropes, spider webs, vines, etc. Let's apply the rope tag to these two splines. But we need to first fix some of the points of the splines, otherwise they will just fall to the ground. And now if we hit play, we have some nice rope-like behavior. Let's say now that we want to have another vine connected between these two vines. This is where the connector tag comes into play. The procedure is the same as before, with the only difference being that we need to make sure that there are adequate points on both splines for the new vine to attach to. Now that everything's in place, we can click on the create button and our three vines are now connected. As you can imagine, we can create a lot of complex effects with just the connector and rope tags. Spiderwebs, for example, would be a piece of cake to do. The only thing that would take most of the time would be actually building the spiderweb shape. But enough about simulation, let's talk about rendering. Immediately after Maxon acquired Redshift, everyone had the exact same thought. When is Redshift going to be included with cinema? Well, that time has come. Sort of. Redshift does come with cinema, but it's a different flavor of it. It's the full-blown version of Redshift, but it uses the CPU instead of the GPU. This means that it won't be as fast as running on GPU, but on the plus side, you can experiment and learn Redshift without the pressure of paying a higher subscription package. And you can also share scenes with others without worrying that they won't be able to render them out, or even worse, having to convert them to physical. The other great thing with this move is the fact that Redshift now feels deeply integrated into cinema. It's no longer a third-party plugin. Redshift lights, uh, materials, even the interactive renderer are now part of cinema's menu system. So it feels like one cohesive piece of software. For example, let's add an area light to our scene. This is the typical light for standard and physical renderer. We now have the handy option to convert it to a redshift area light, which speeds things up immensely, especially if you're having to convert an older cinema scene to redshift. But it goes one step further. If we switch the renderer from standard to redshift, the lights on the interface will now be redshift lights. So if we now add an area light, it will be a redshift light. And the same applies to materials. If we're using the standard renderer, double clicking in the material manager will create a material for the standard or physical renderer. If we switch to Redshift, double clicking will create a Redshift material. And speaking of materials, we now have a new node that more closely follows the material structure of other renderers, which makes moving back and forth between renderers a much smoother experience. Of course, if you're used to the old Redshift material, it's still there, but now you can choose between the older and the newer type of material. There are also some small viewport improvements on how Redshift materials are previewed, especially when it comes to metallic or emissive materials, or materials using alphas. So, that's Redshift. Let's now talk about modeling. If you're modeling in cinema, this is going to be one of the best quality of life releases ever. There's a ton of small little functions and commands that speed things up immensely. For example, let's take the poke command. This one is perfect for surface work like grips and handles. With just a couple of clicks, we can get details that would have taken much longer to do. Another huge time saver has to be the fit circle command. All that's needed for the tool to work is a selection. Polygon, edge, or point, it doesn't matter. Once we have that, we can easily get a circular shape thanks to the interactive options of the tool. 
We also have some nice additions to the bridge tool, making connections between surfaces a breeze. This one is also interactive, and as you can see, it's going to be a huge time saver. But by far, my favorite addition has to be the grid option in the close polygon hole command. This one works like magic. It takes into account the surrounding geometry and tries to fill in the area with quads that also follow the geometry's curvature. It's really amazing to see. And with that, I think we've covered pretty much all major features of R26. There are some smaller features I haven't covered, but I think the modeling, rendering, and simulation additions are the ones that will interest you the most. The one change I haven't covered and you will immediately see once you open up Cinema, it's going to be the updates to the UI. There we have capitalized sections for menu groups and a new design for the tabs, but these are small cosmetic changes, so it's nothing really that important. So, what do you think? Is that a thumbs up or a thumbs down release? Let me know in the comments below. Take care, and I'll see you on the next one.